rejoicing to stand before you all uh, and one more time with the word of God and thank God for all his faithfulness in our lives and I trust that God has been with in all your lives as well and providing all our needs um, for today's meditation I'm going to continue in our series that we've been speaking about which is the new and living way the new and living way and for today's meditation I'm going to actually start off with a story from the Old Testament before I go to the next topic and that is in 1st Samuel chapter 30 I'm going to remain in here for so if you if you'll keep that portion open and I'll refer to uh, portions in Ephesians as well later but I'm going to remain in here primarily so 1 Samuel chapter 30. This is a very uh, familiar passage to us. This uh, portion is very familiar to us. And it is the story of David and his men as they were um, dwelling in different places, going from place to place, um, really just hiding from Saul while David was awaiting his coronation to be the next king of Israel, right? Uh, we all know David's faithfulness and how he did not force his hand to be the next king even though he knew God had anointed him to be the next king. Uh, just because it came to my mind, I will just say this point that many times even though God has prepared a certain position or something like that for us, uh, there is a time that God has prepared as well. So we are not called to force our hand or to act uh, in a way that is unbecoming of who we are. So just like David, he humbled himself and he waited. Just like Jesus, he humbled himself while he was on this earth and he waited for the time of God to be restored back to glory. So anyway, so back to David. He was in a place called Ziklag with, and we'll know later that there were 600 strong men and their families and children and they were in Ziklag, and while they were away, it doesn't say clearly what they were doing. Um, while the men were away, the Amalekites came up from the south and burned up the whole city and the place where their families were and their wives and children. They didn't, it clearly says they did not kill anybody, but they captured all their families and all their possessions and the Amalekites took them captive as prisoners of war back to where they were to the Amalekite camp um, and so when David came and so he uh, and his men came and he saw what had happened and in verse 4 says and then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And then even verse 6 says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. So, Ziklag was a, um, well, I, I believe under control of the Philistines at that point, but it was previously uh, originally given to Judah as their inheritance uh, back in Joshua, and then later uh, given to Simeon. And now Ziklag, there's no particular meaning. Uh, I think it means winding or something. But either way, I, I believe there are so many parallels between Christ's time on earth and his, uh, uh, and his work on the cross here with Ziklag uh, and how he defeated the enemy on the cross. Uh, I believe there's a lot of parallels, but that's not my point today. Uh, my point is about what happened here specifically with the families of uh, David and his men. Okay, so and that is actually the next part of our series, which is about... Um, new families is what we're, we're calling it. So as, as we read the portion here, the families of these men, even though they were mighty men of God, and they did great battles, 
We know they were strongly connected or their families are a huge part of them. So much so that when they lost the families that they had, these mighty men of battle, these men who had killed so many people, so many of their enemies conquered cities, they were reduced to such a condition that they, had, they were crying so much. They were crying like babies, right? And they were weeping so much and that they were completely exhausted from weeping. And they didn't know what to do in their distress. They even were thinking about stoning David. They were in such a distress. They were going to stone David over this, what just happened. And it was in this situation that they were. Um, and that's the story we just read. So we can see the place that the family had for their lives. Everything that they did was for their families. So the men went and did what they needed to do for battle, but their family, they were all about their families. And that is the next, so you'll see uh, the picture there uh, that depicts what just happened. And this whole story, as you read, you'll see, and I'll come back to it, uh, but you'll see that um, they went and captured their families back, right? So this, um, this, uh, this topic that we're going to go into is one of the most important ones in our series that we're outlining because of the importance that God places on families as part of the church. And, God, and you can see that from right from the beginning of the Bible. In the, in the Garden of Eden itself, God established the first family in the world. Right? And he said, whom God had joined together, let no man set asunder. So, so that's why this, in the series, that's why the new family series, we're going to take a few weeks to go through different aspects of this topic. And I'm just introducing the topic here. But it is not an accident that it comes after new fruit. Okay, so just for uh, folks who are not attending, we're talking through a topic called New and Living Way, where God has... Uh, the, talking through the different aspects of being a Christian and his plan of salvation. We started with the new covenant that he made with us, how we're born again, and give us a new heart. And then the last uh, four weeks, we spoke about bearing new fruit, the fruit that is different from our old man, right? And this fruit consists of nine different aspects that we spoke through the last few weeks, which, uh, which is mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, which love, joy, peace, and all of the nine different fruits, right? Fruit, sorry, singular. And all the nine aspects of the nature of God that we ourselves bear within ourselves as we progress and mature as Christians. Right, you all with me? No, quiet today. Yes? Okay, so, um, so, so like I said, it's not an accident that new family comes after new fruit because it is within our families that we get a chance to exercise and develop and mature our fruit. Because that's why God, God said, in the New Testament says, what well, judgment must begin in the house of God. It begins, if you can't display your fruit in your family, you know, you were just posing in public. You can act like who you want outside to other people, but in your family where, where there's, you know, where there's just your... Uh, your husband or your wife or your children present and how do you act in their midst is who we really are. So God has really given us a way to develop and mature our fruit, right? Yes, fruit of joy and love. When things are not going our way, do we exhibit love and joy and peace when, when, we, uh, when our husband or wife doesn't do what we want or our children don't do what we want them to do? or our parents are uh, uh, telling us things that we don't particularly like to do, do we exhibit our fruit in those moments? Right? This is a chance that God has given us to mature and develop our fruit. Right? So that's why new family is such an important topic, but there's so many compli complex things to think about when you think about family, especially in today's context on what we are seeing playing out uh, from a cultural standpoint. So... 
we'll, we'll try to thread the needle and try to um, bring to you uh, what God, how, what God, how God leads us on these multiple aspects on such an important part of the, of the church. So, but before we uh, go any further, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a chemistry lesson. Um, and so what you're seeing there is, uh, I can't read all the words, but the picture should be sufficient. This is the atomic structure. Uh, this particular one is, uh, uh, is nitrogen. Uh, but it, this is how every element, right, is structured. And this is how God built every material thing that you see. Has, if you look under a powerful microscope, you can see an atom like this. Yes? So, and of course, scientists have found further, you know, smaller particles, but these atoms are the building block of every naturally occurring element in the world. You all with me? Yes. Okay, so, but if you look at this atom, there's three primary components. The middle of the atom is comprised of, depending on what metal or element it is, neutrons and protons, right? And those uh, components are so strongly bound together, right? That if you separate them, there is such a powerful release of energy that we, you know, we talk about nuclear explosion, I will talk about that later. Nuclear explosion releases so much energy that you can either channel to generate power or to, you know, destroy things, right? So such power is combined or, or comprised or contained within the nucleus of an atom that just separating it creates so much destruction. You all with me? You seeing the parallels? So I compare that to the bond between the man and the woman. The God's family that God set up in the Garden of Eden. Right? God set up the first family in the same way. I believe that God, you can see the pattern of God in everything in nature. Right? When he made animals, he said made a male and female. Yes? When he said the first family, man shall not be apart from his wife. He leave his father and his mother, cleave unto his wife, and form this sort of bond that you find in the nucleus of an atom. Yes? And then you see these electrons, which I compare them to children, right? They are rotating around this nucleus that um, are under the power and influence of the nucleus, the attraction of the nucleus, and each element, depending on how, what element you're talking about, nitrogen or hydrogen, you all know your periodic tables as well in school, know that each one has a different number, right? We all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different countries or, or families or traditions. It doesn't matter, but inside, under the color of our skin or the habits that we formed over years, we all have the same basic structure. Yes? We all have the same nucleus uh, uh, each atom has the same nucleus driving it. Yes? So this is how God set up that such a powerful, it's tiny, but such a powerful bond is what God set up. That's why you can see that when God first created, and so even though Adam sinned and he was cast out of the garden, right? That he, they continued the family system. It did not break down. They continued this new, I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence. I didn't look up the history, but believe that a nuclear family is, could be based on this kind of structure, right? That the, the strength of communities, the strength of society starts with the strength of the families underlying or the building blocks of, of uh, neighborhoods and communities and society and churches is the strength of the family. You all with me? Yes? Can I get an amen? Yes. Amen. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, so God built and designed this way. Okay? When you have multiple powerful things combined together with powerful bonds, it's hard to break things down. Yes? It's hard to break things down when they're joined together so powerfully. And when you have multiple families come together, bonded together by love and cooperation, it's hard to break that bond. Right? Yes? So this is how God designed society. But like I said, they continued 
this way from the fall uh, for generations, right? And, and through the passage of time, through history, you can see the family pattern, no matter what country you go to, the family pattern in one way or the other continues and it is the building block of society. You all with me? Yeah. Yes? So what happens though, as you'll go to the next slide, like I was referencing the um, nuclear explosion. When you have, um, when you have, you know, so what happens in a nuclear reaction, like new fusion, uh, fission reaction, is you take something like a uh, unstable compound uh, element like uranium, right, and you bombard with them with neutrons at high speed, and it the nucleus of that element separates into two new elements, and it releases such a great amount of energy that you can use that energy to power, you know, to generate ele electricity and generate so much power. Or, if it's an uncontrolled chain reaction, it creates uh, such a destructive energy that, you know, we, we've seen in history, right, where the atom bomb was dropped uh, in Japan in two cities and destroyed two cities just from one, you know, from one bomb destroyed each city, right? So that is a power of breaking down the, this one little atom, right? So that, so I view this as time has passed, right? The, the system or the building blocks that God has set up in his design has been degraded by, of course, man's sin nature working out in society, right? And, and what you call so-called cultural wars, we can, we can talk about breaking down or even doubting what is the, God's design for a family. You all with me? Yes? So, so I believe that society has gone away through the passage of time, through the corruption of sin, away from God's original design for the family. And, and sadly, the church has also succumbed in many ways because of this you know, cultural war. So when you look at these neutrons and you compare to what's causing our breakdown, right? Is you would so matter what, no matter what you call it, right? As if you look at the American society, if I'll just start with World War II and after, right? We prospered so much after the war, and we, uh, as a society, had you know inc an increase in wealth and comfort and peace and safety that we started to undo and unwind things that God had uh, provided for our success, right? And eventually, you know, we, uh, we were influenced by media and, and, uh, and mass communication methods and all these things influence. These are neutrons that bombard us daily, right? And now we cannot escape from things that influence us daily. Each of our minds are influenced by whether it's social media or uh, things we watch on television or whatever, right? And again, I'm not speaking against those specific things. I'm just telling you of what we're influenced by today. So as we're, you know, swayed and influenced by different ideas, and we are, if we're not grounded on the foundational word of God, Amen. that over time erodes what God set up as the foundational building blocks of society. You all with me? Um, so that's what I am saying has being bombarded by so, uh, neutrons has dis generate so much destructive force that families are being torn apart, societies are is torn apart. Now we don't even, we can't even publicly say what we believe a family should be. Yes? yes. yes. So that's what happens when you are, when you walk away from the principles laid down by God. Yes? You all with me? So, now, but what should happen? What is the solution? Because we as Christians, we often, uh, you know, resort to, we think that just like the apostles, you know, after Jesus' ascension, they they thought Jesus was going to now take the 
kingdom away from Rome and restore Israel to its previous glory and establish it as a superpower on earth. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're talking about. This is not our calling. You know, I mean, I'm glad when we have leaders that, you know, support God's uh, principles, but we are not called to, you know, overthrow or, or to establish political leaders that, you know, support our way of thinking. We can't, because we can't, we can't, we, we, we can't maintain our Christian principles and the two don't go together. Yes? We should always support uh, people that we believe, you know, stand for the truth. But my point is, we cannot force God's kingdom into this world. It is not going to happen unless God comes back and establishes his kingdom upon, upon his millennial reign. We're going to see further degradation of society. Further moving away from Christian principles. Yes? But what we can do is bring the power of the gospel that changes lives. That the power of the word of God, we were talking to these brothers from the Gideon Society. We can, they shared with us stories of the word of God transforming lives. This is the means or mechanism that God has put in place to change lives, to change society, to restore God's uh, building blocks of society, which is, you know, which is the families. And when I say family, I'm not just talking about our individual family units, right? We, uh, we, we have the parents and the children, and you, you have your extended family, but I'm also talking about the church family, right? We're not meant to be, you know, just focus on the things that, and the needs of our own individual families who are related by blood or by marriage. That is not, yes, that is how, you know, as, as children of the world, how we're related to each other is through blood. But we know that we are called, as we've been speaking, into this new covenant. And the, it is the blood of Christ that unites us. Right? I always laugh that we, you know, we, uh, and again, I'm not saying we should change this, but, you know, when we meet another Christian, especially Malayalis, uh, we say brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. Right? Uh, I'm not saying stop doing that, but if you think about it, did you act, do you actually call your own brother I don't call my brother, hey brother Bob, how you doing? Do we need these things to reinforce that, oh, you know what, I gotta fool myself to thinking this is my little brother. I'm not saying that we should stop doing that, but do we actually treat our brothers and sisters in Christ as real brothers and sisters in Christ? Because the, being united by the blood of Christ is stronger the by being related by blood. You all with me? I mean, some of us are proud of our family history and heritage. Nothing wrong with that if it doesn't get in the way of who we think we are. Yes? Your relationship through Christ, the blood of Christ, is stronger than your relationship through your generations. Yes? This is what we have to understand. So building blocks with our own families, but united together with other families in Christ um, in the church. And these uh, many different aspects of this is what we are hoping to cover. If you go to the next slide, uh, I'll just quickly talk through a um, couple more things. So Ephesians, if you read Ephesians from start to finish, it really gives you a blueprint of the family. It starts with the beginning, how we were adopted into the family of God, and moves on to say we have no place um, in to be part of the commonwealth of Israel or to be part of this covenant. But God adopted us just like you know, uh, children who have no parents are adopted into a new family, and they become part of that family. We were adopted. We have no right. We have no privilege to be called children of God. But God, when we were yet sinners, died for our sins and made a way through his blood to now to be merged into the family of God. The blood of Christ, which I was just talking about, 
which is more powerful than the natural family relationship we have in blood. The blood of Christ is what made a way to be joined into the family of God and now makes us sons and daughters of God. Amen? Yeah, you can take the richest family in this country and you, you can walk up to the gate and say, hey, I want to be part of your family. Mm -hmm. Ain't going to happen, right? You have to come down through the bloodline or through marriage to be accepted into a family. You can't just force yourself into a family just because you want to be part of that family. But being part of God's family is not that way. Amen? The death of Jesus on the cross made a way for us to be part, to be joined into the kingdom of God. We had no privilege, no right to be part of the kingdom of God. But the blood of Christ, every drop of his blood that he shed on the cross made a way for us to be, have, we don't need anybody's approval. We don't need anybody to grant us this right. We can freely walk in and be part of this kingdom. You all with me? And so Ephesians lays this out really good. And it says, we were yet sinners. And, and then in chapter 3, verse 15, of whom, and this is talking about Jesus. Uh, I'll start with verse 14. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Amen. So you can see the structure that God has set up. The family of God existed before us. Okay, God, the Father, before eternity. You know, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit existed in eternity. And it's, it actually says, let, in Genesis chapter uh, 2, let us, let us make man in our own image. He didn't say, let me make man. He said, let us make man. That means it's a trinity. God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit existed before the creation of man. And, and existed as God. And this pattern is repeated. And you can see, I talk about this all the time. And you can see, if you look, and if you observe, you can see the pattern of God in everything. Right? So you may, and we talked about this before, body, soul, and spirit. Man is made in this tri, uh, triumphant image of God. Yes? And so man, when he joins with a woman, it becomes a family unit. And they are one flesh. Right? And you have children, and you become the family building block the same way when we join into the family of God, our families and our churches combined together, we are under the leadership and the headship of Jesus Christ, of whom well, the whole family on earth and heaven is named. There is no power in the earth or in heaven that will not bow their knees unto our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All of the families in this world are subject to the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. But when we are alive in this world, we have a chance to join into this new covenant, to enter into this kingdom, and to, be, to bear fruit for His pleasure as a family of God. And if you read on in Ephesians, you'll see that um, in chapter... You know, he talks about chapter 4 and then 5. He talks about how a marriage should be and how the role of a wife and a husband. And as Malayalis, we often focus about the role of the wife and we ignore the role of the husband. But in fact, the bar is higher for a husband because we are compared to how Christ uh, gave himself for the church. Right? So as a husband, we are called to, to love our wives just like he loved us, which meant he gave himself completely for us. He did not crush us, put us under his feet, and to make us uh, his servant, but he made us a son and a daughter. So we'll talk about all of this in the coming weeks, but the model of the family is given so clearly in the book of Ephesians. It's in different parts, but if you read start to end, you can see God's design for a Christian family. You all with me? Yes? Everybody happy? Okay, so... Um, so coming back to Ziklag in 1 Samuel chapter 30. So, um, so 
So when we, when we come back to verse 6 is where we stopped. But, and I'll ask the worship team to come up. Uh, but David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But the situation looked very dire there. And David himself was about to lose his leadership, lose the trust of his people. Sometimes we're in the situation we seem like all is lost and people start to doubt our ability to be to do what we're supposed to do, to be a leader wherever God has placed us. And he brought, was brought to such a low point, they lost their strength because they lost their families. And then first says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Amen. This is what we have to return to do. We can't restore God's family, way of family, by looking to the world. We can't force our way up on society with our own strength. But when we turn to God in the midst of uh, break, breaking down of society or breaking down of, of moral values, we have to return to God and, and encourage ourselves, and worship team, come on up, uh, encourage ourselves in the Lord. It is only in Him we can find the strength and the wisdom to to, uh, to display the power of the gospel, to change lives. It is only in His power that works through us that we can restore the family unit, re build up strong families that love each other, and families that work with other families, and, and build up the foundation of the church once again. Because the devil knows this very well. If he breaks down the family unit, which is what... When I showed, I, I failed to mention, you know, with the, exa the picture of the, uh, the uh, nuclear bomb, is the devil is sending these things because he knows if he breaks down the family unit, he can weaken the church. The strength and power of the church is in the strength and power and the, and the love of the family unit. You all with me? But we have to be ready to do fight the battle. As David did, he went into the camp of the Amalekites and he, just, he and his strong men destroyed them from one evening till the evening the next day. Destroyed and took back everything. Uh, you go to the last slide. Uh, and verse, uh, verse 18 of chapter 30. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. Everything. Uh, their families, their children, their possessions. This is what God is expecting us to do. Let us not back down from waging this battle. But this battle is not in public discourse. This battle is in the closet on our knees. This battle is in situations where we can share, you know, we allow ourselves to be transformed by the word of God. This battle happens with the transformation within ourselves and trusting in God and his strength. You all with me? Are we ready for God to work in us and in our families? Are we ready to be the hands and feet of Christ in our fam beginning in our families and, and expanding that into other families and people that have need? There's an interesting uh, part, I won't read it, but so then uh, only 400 of the 600 strong men went to battle. 200 of them were so exhausted and so scared that they just stayed back uh, I think it was a halfway point, I'm not sure. Um, and they watched all their possessions. When they came back, this 400 told David, we, we don't need, we only can give their family back. We're not going to share any of the loot with them. But David said, what did David say? David said, no, God gave us this victory. God gave us all our possessions back. How can we treat other people as if we gained all these things with our strength? You all with me? Yes. So sometimes the way we interact with people need to be filled with grace and mercy. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. We might disagree with people. Doesn't mean that we treat them different than we would, we, God would treat us. You all with me? And we'll talk more about this later. But I don't have the time to go into all of this. But let us remember that everything we have, 
Everything we are is by the grace of God. Amen. Even the strength and, and the continuation of our families is by the grace of God. That is the only reason and we are united by the blood of Christ. But it is by the grace of God that we stand. So we can sing just like Moses did in Psalm 90. O oh Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place through all generations. He is our rock that we can hide in. He is the source of our strength. So let us, if we think we've lost everything, we feel like our, our family is going away from what we wanted, let us strengthen ourselves just like David did and come back to God and seek Him for whatever our needs are. May His name be glorified. Amen.